Court of Appeal in and for the Fifth District of the State of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Jamie R. Grossman's judge presiding. All persons having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the session of the Fifth District Court of Appeals. Uh, as I was already introduced, I'm Jamie Grosshands. Uh, also on the panel today, to my right, is Judge Eric Eisnagel, and to my left is Judge Meredith Sasso. Um, we're very glad to be here today. Thank you for being here as well. Um, I will ask that you just make sure your cell phones are turned off before we get started. Uh, each side will have the 20 minutes. I'll go ahead and reserve five minutes for rebuttal, but when you come up, if you would like more please let me know and I will adjust that time. We will take a break after the second case today um, in order to uh, have a panel switch uh, for the third and fourth cases and also we will be having coffee if any of you attorneys would like to stay we'll join you in the attorney lounge for coffee after we take a break after that second uh, round of cases. Um, do we have uh, the first case we're going to do today is swearing gin. Do we have an appellee? Anyone here for Rio Villa Unit? Yes, would you mind? Thank you. Hello. I know you're fine. Are you, any of you happen to be here for Rio? Okay, excellent. You can take your seat. <laughs> nope, we had just called it. Perfect timing. <laughs> All right, would you like to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court, Nicholas Vidoni on behalf of the appellant Robert Swearingen. There are five issues that warrant reversal here. The first is whether the circuit court lacked jurisdiction to dismiss the case because uh, the claim was essentially less than $15,000. Uh, the second is whether the circuit court Counsel, on the jurisdictional issue, you, you re-raised both claims, correct? Yes. So, I mean, uh, Pelley argues that conferred jurisdiction on the circuit court. Why not? Uh, essentially, that argument is a claimant override theory. It's essentially the idea that a litigant can override court orders. That whole theory has no basis in, fa in law, this court, or no court. Well, perhaps the, co perhaps the circuit court did not have jurisdiction to reconsider its prior ruling or, uh, you know, reverse itself. Um, but <clears throat> what happens when a party files an action in a court when the court doesn't have jurisdiction? It doesn't just ignore the filing, right? It dismisses it for lack of jurisdiction. Or it can... Um send it to the proper jurisdiction. I think here... But in this case, um, the, 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 uh, the second cause of action would not have been proper in county court, correct? The, the um, equitable jurisdiction case? Is that what we're talking about? There's, well, you had two causes of action, correct? Well, we have one cause of action, one cause of action under the FCCPA and two relief two issues of relief sought, one for injunctive relief, one for up to $1,000. And the injunctive and relief had been dismissed with prejudice? Yes. Correct. And so your argument is the circuit court no longer had jurisdiction over that, correct? Yes. However, nevertheless, after, the, after it was dismissed with prejudice, your client raised it again Yes, and I think in the circuit court. I think there was an issue, there's a gray area in the law as to whether we need to re-raise it or not to preserve the dismissal for appellate purposes. Well, I mean, that seems like a side trail, but, but let's go down it for a moment. What, what's, what's the argument that you needed to re-raise it after it's been dismissed with prejudice? Well, well, there's some case law, and I've cited in my brief, that suggests that if you don't re-raise the 
um, issue that's been dismissed, you can waive it on appeal if you go and file. And that's typically only when it's been dismissed without prejudice. Yeah, I, I don't think the case law is quite that crystal clear on uh, what happens to dismissals. And we I, I were think taking the issue a, is here, though, it, the court needed to act on the repled complaint, right? A court, like Judge Eisenhower pointed out, cannot simply ignore the complaint. It can't ignore the complaint, but I think we, we've, uh, it can also can't ignore the previous orders being entered. If it already dismissed the claim for injunctive relief, that claim's gone. It doesn't matter whether it's in the complaint or not. Well, I counsel, think it, procedurally, what would the judge have done with your claim for injunctive relief uh, when you filed the second amended complaint? I think it, it, it just reaffirms the previous order or, or acts as though the previous order you know, um, was still in effect and, uh, and remand the case down to county court, which had jurisdiction. Okay. Do, you, do you agree that you could have filed, the court would have had jurisdiction to hear a motion for rehearing or reconsideration of the dismissal? Um, I think that they would after the dismissal of the whole case. The, for a motion for rehearing, you need a final resolution of the entire case, I believe. And um, so, when the case was fully dismissed, I could move for rehearing on that issue. And do you, and think, I, and that it, do you think that it matters that you didn't have a final judgment entered in the case yet when it went to uh, the circuit court? Um, on the second amended complaint? Yes. Yeah, when the second amended complaint went back to the circuit court, we also asked that the court remand because we think that the uh, claims remaining under the, the procedure that we were given um, meant that we could only seek up to $1,000 in statutory damages that needed to go down to the county court. Um, the circuit court didn't have jurisdiction over that naked claim. Was there a reason you didn't just file it in county court? Um, I, we filed it in uh, circuit court because of the injunction, injunctive relief claim. Um, I think that was the main reason that we wanted to be in circuit court. The jurisdictional statute um, seems to suggest that um, when you're seeking an injunction, uh, circuit court might be the most proper place to go. And uh, 26.012 subsection uh, 2, it says that circuit courts have original jurisdiction in all cases of equity. Well, what about when the circuit court warned that in, in the absence of a new claim for injunctive relief that um, the amended pleading needs to be filed in county court? Um, I think if we filed it in county court as another claim, we would have been past the statute, we'd likely have been past the statute of limitations. I don't think that we had that opportunity. That's why we asked that the court remand it back down to county court rather than, um, than just dismiss the case. So you see, you're, you think the circuit court should have, <clears throat> after it dismissed with prejudice and then you repled the injunctive claim, you think that the circuit court should have again dismissed the injunctive claim but sent the, um, the statutory claim down to the county court? No, I think it was already dismissed. They don't need to dismiss something that's already dismissed. Well, you ref the problem is you refiled it. Yes. Right, so what do they do with the refiled injunctive claim? They ignore the injunctive relief claim because the order already says that that's dismissed and our pleading was pretty clear saying that we were only raising it for preserving it on appeal. Well, is that, is that what a circuit, well, let's say you only had one claim and it was for injunctive relief. Yes. And the, the, the circuit court dismisses it with prejudice and, and you nevertheless um, file it again. Does the, is the circuit court simply to ignore it and let it sit on the, the books, if you will? Or does it dismiss it for lack of jurisdiction? Well, you're, if I've got one claim and I've pled injunctive relief, right, and it's with leave to amend, that's the... the no, 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 it was with prejudice, okay. but yet you file it again. Then it's a nullity. So the, cir the circuit court is required to just let it sit there and do nothing with it. I don't think that they need to do anything with a, a pleading that's a nullity. Let, let's say, for example, you have a non-party file something in the case. That non-party doesn't have, and they file a motion. 
that non party doesn't have any right to have that motion heard if they're not a party to the motion might be different than than a cause of action the right it's different but essentially it's the same thing of if it's outside the procedural bounds or if it's outside the scope of the court's previous orders then it's treated as a nullity and it just sits there on the docket it sits there on the docket but there is no action that needs to be taken would it be in your view would it be improper for the circuit court to dismiss that cause of action for lack of jurisdiction um, for the the second case the second complaint that's filed after dismissal of prejudice correct they could You're file saying, another order saying that you know this case was dismissed the complaint was previously dismissed and I'm so your position is they, they the circuit court could do so but doesn't have to yeah because I mean just think about it a complaint um, is filed that's dismissed with prejudice somebody files a, a complaint again following that when they, you have a the complaint that's dismissed with prejudice at least in that single count the um, finality of the case has has happened and anything that happens afterward is a nullity. There isn't any more continuing jurisdiction unless you're within a motion for rehearing or a motion for, uh, uh, to vacate a judgment. That the, the case law is pretty clear that the court pretty much has very limited jurisdiction after finality has happened. So what about the merits? Um, uh, the merits are we've got two main issues. The, uh, one issue is whether the the claim for injunctive relief was properly stricken and uh, the issue of whether the um, the fines are debt as contemplated by the FCCPA and whether the estoppel letter is a communication um, under the FCCPA. How, how was the estoppel letter, uh, I mean essentially the, isn't the issue there whether it was an attempt to collect the debt, the estoppel letter? Well I think you need to go back to the text. The text says um, and I quote, in collecting a consumer debt, no person shall, and, it, it, um, and I'm citing 559.72. So the question is um, whether it's in the course of collecting and it's a communication in the course. Um, right, so how is the estoppel letter, I mean, clearly it's a communication, right? Yes. So we got that. But how is the estoppel letter um, a communication in the course of collecting? Yeah, because um, of the nature of estoppels in the HOA and condominium context, the estoppel is supposed to function as um, a debt resolution instrument to make sure that there aren't any debts that could possibly transfer over when um, a seller hands over the property to a buyer in a purchase and sale agreement. And so, um, does it matter who the debt collection letter is sent to? I don't think so. There, there, the case law on the FDCPA and FCCPA talks about um, communications sent to an agent. Um, there's case law from the FDCPA that talks about okay, the debt collector sends um, this letter to the uh, the consumer's attorney, which is going to be an agent, and uh, you don't get a pass just because it was sent to the attorney. It's still considered a communication to the consumer. So as long as it's to the consumer or to the consumer's agent, it's the same thing. Difference. And so who was this sent to? This was sent to uh, the consumer's agent. I think the, I, I believe it looks like it was to Alliance Title who was um, acting on the, the, the um, seller's behalf to do the closing on this piece of property. And um, so uh, to return to whether this is a, uh, a communication under the FCCPA, um, the federal courts have talked about how um, the definition of communication is extremely broad. Um, that's Caceres versus McCalla Raymer. Um, and uh, the 11th Circuit has given us a um, kind of the indicia of debt collection, which is um, if, does it demand payment or does it state the amount? Did of the debt? estoppel letter demand payment? It says that it is um, um, the assessment is past due, 
and it says it's a the invoice says it's a bill to and it says it's due on receipt but that was the invoice that was attached to the letter yes, I, th I think based on though that language it's demanding a debt um, based upon the fact that the invoice was attached to the estoppel estoppel letter <clears throat> the fact yeah I mean it's all one communication so you have a uh, uh, and and do you think the intent was for for the title company to make sure that the uh, the fund the debt was paid is um, that well I mean how it happens with estoppels is that, like let's say the title company here gets an estoppel then they have to go and turn around to the seller and say this is what they're claiming to do we need to pay that up or at least resolve it um, prior to the sale and that may be I mean. That may be what sometimes happens, right? But that's that's not required. The sale could just not happen. The sale could just not happen. Yeah, you can. So isn't it just informing the amount that is owed by someone, not necessarily demanding payment? Um, I don't think that that's the way estoppels work. I think that the, when um, the legislature recently amended the the uh, statutes for HOAs and condos, clarifying what estoppels function as. And I think they, they've, the amendments say that if you want to collect any debt, it needs to be included in that uh, return to stop. So at least... As, well, I mean, right, because it wouldn't be, in, in, it otherwise wouldn't be enforceable, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's the whole point of an estoppel is you need to... The whole point is you're notifying someone, hey, this is owed, just so you know. It, well, it's to notify somebody, but it's also a debt resolution instrument to collect anything that's due. What, what authority do you have for that statement? I, I, well, I found, I've um, got the case of um, Agin versus Katzman and Kaur from the Southern District of Florida in 2004. There it says, an estoppel letter is a resolution instrument whereby if certain conditions are met, the disputed debt is resolved. And there they um, found that an estoppel letter was a communication related to debt collection. Um, then you also have a list of um, federal decisions that talk about payoff letters for mortgages, which are almost exactly the same as estoppel letters. And it, sometimes when you're getting a payoff letter, people call it an estoppel for a mortgage. And those are consistently regarded as communications related to debt. So in your view, a payoff letter and an estoppel letter are essentially the same thing? Uh, yeah, they're essentially the same thing because you're asking to for what needs to be closed out before a new person can take over the title. That's, that's not what an estoppel letter does. There, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that says that um, the buyer can't can take the property subject to the debt, right? Yeah, but it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be resolved. It, but it tr usually is. Well, usually is, but, but am I right? It doesn't have to be, correct? Yeah, but I mean, it's something that where somebody gets an estoppel letter back and they say it's, I mean, isn't the isn't the buyer's decision essentially right? It's the buyer's decision, but the buyer uses that uh, estoppel or payoff, and might re reduce the purchase price to account for the debt being assumed. I mean, they might, but they might not, right? I mean, it, it, anyone can do any, anything. I mean, an estoppel letter is essentially a notice to the buyer: Hey, there's this debt. If you buy this property, you're going to owe this debt. Yeah. Right. I, I, and that, that whole thing, but the buyer you're doesn't, owe this debt, means the, that you're going to need to pay well, it. Just, the, but the buyer doesn't owe the debt. At least not yet, right? Yeah. But somebody's going to have to pay. It's either going to be the buyer or the seller. And an estoppel letter is essentially saying somebody needs to pay it. It doesn't function any other way than somebody's got to pay. And if it, somebody's got to pay, it's related to debt collection. Doesn't the, isn't the HOA required to uh, send the estoppel letter? Uh, does it have, does it have, once it, is it optional? Once the, uh, a person, an owner, invokes the right to receive an estoppel letter, then the HOA has to provide it. And th they can put whatever they want in there. If, I think what they should have done in this case is put zero amount due, because I think what they claimed wasn't legally valid. But that's a different issue, right? That's, yes. a, that's a separate issue. Yeah. Well, let's assume for the moment it was legally valid. Okay. So you're, you're saying their only option was to waive what they were owed? Um, I'm, not, I'm not following the question. Well, let's say it was a valid, uh, the, let's assume for a moment the val that was valid. Okay. They get the request for the estoppel letter, they have no choice but to send it, right? So what do they do? 
uh, well, someone's going to pay it, but also if it's legally valid, then the cause of action under the FCCPA doesn't arise. Well, I'm just talking about, I'm, we're just talking about whether the estoppel letter is an attempt to collect a debt, right? Yes. So they get the request for the estoppel letter. They're required to send one at this point. Yes. What do they do? The to, HOA? Yeah. I mean, the, what does I the HOA do? They ask what is legally valid, and if it is legally valid, then they just send it back. And that's usually what happens under estoppels. Uh, this estoppel was a fairly abnormal estoppel that I've seen, where you have 16 grand that somebody's never heard about before being claimed, essentially <laughs> put on that person out of nowhere. All right, Council, you are into your rebuttal time. You only have about two minutes left. Okay. Do you want to reserve that? Uh, yes. Okay. Kelly and Luckert and I are here for uh, Rio uh, Property Owners Association. Again, Judge, we were sitting right out there, uh, Judge and uh, I would have been right here, except I was spending a lot of my time trying to figure out this Agrello case, which um, frankly baffles me a little bit, and I'm sure we'll get into that. But I'd like to preface by saying a lot of this has to do, I think, with some of the effects of what this court's ruling will be in terms of litigation in Florida in this consumer area. And I've had the opportunity to actually litigate a few of these cases in my career. And as I always understood, the purpose was to protect consumers from harassment from debt collection services. Now, that's been expanded over the course of the some 30 odd years that 559 has been in effect, and there's a lot of exceptions here and there. But I think what the court's looking at here is an expansion way out of the norm. Right. About Before we get to kind of the merits of the debt collection, can you address the subject matter jurisdiction question? Um, because that is something, before we even get to that, that I think um, we would like to, to hear the thoughts on. Does a court have jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, or in procedural jurisdiction, whatever you're going to call it, um, once it, uh, a claim has been dismissed? Well, if they dismiss the, dis the equitable relief throughout the whole thing, then maybe they'd have a leg to stand on. Or if they hadn't claimed through paragraph, I think it was two through the entire uh, amended, uh, original amended and second amended complaint that the court had jurisdiction. I mean, there is this, this estoppel. And in this instance, the estoppel is if you plead that the court has jurisdiction, you shouldn't be able to come back later and assert the court does not have jurisdiction. So I'd ask the court to take a look at A party can't, though, waive can't or consent or confer jurisdiction by estoppel, though. Right. Uh, and neither uh, can a party induce error by claiming to the court that it's really not an issue because you do have jurisdiction. And then later come back and before the appellate court and maybe after your second amended complaint, now come back and say that the court does not. And well, I think we know. I have well, a, I think I think the court. There's no question that the if the claim was just for a thousand dollars, then the court did not have subject matter jurisdiction. Correct. That's that's complete. Um, now, as far as the first claim, it had been dismissed. So let's say there was no additional complaint and they filed just the equitable claim again. Would the court have the opportunity to rule on it again? You're, Judge, I want to make sure I get this straight. So in the, the amended complaint, they have equity, and then they dropped equity for the second amended complaint? No, I'm just saying they, let's just say the only thing was an injunctive relief claim. The court dismisses it with prejudice. They refile an injunctive relief claim. Does that, does the court have any jurisdiction to reopen the case and consider it? As long as that equitable relief is there, the circuit court would have jurisdiction to rule on these claims. Well, there's if the equitable relief is out, then my understanding of the law would be that they that if it was only a thousand dollars and were at damages, then they would not. Well, I think that begs the be question. Transferred. I think that's kind of the I think that's kind of the question. And if if the panel doesn't mind, I would just ask that. And I don't think this is a written rule or anything, but if we could just have one person at the okay, Judge, the uh, podium at a time, and if you need to con confer, that's, the idea. that's that's fine, certainly, but. Um, so I think that begs the question, though, right? I mean, the question is, did the circuit court have jurisdiction 
um, over the case. And appellant says the circuit court did not. And despite the fact that they raised it again, and I understand that that sort of probably created some confusion, um, nevertheless, that doesn't change whether or not the circuit court had jurisdiction. And so appellant says, look, the circuit court didn't have jurisdiction over the case anymore. It would have been proper for the circuit court to once again dismiss the injunctive, the claim for injunctive relief. But, but as to the other claim, since it didn't have jurisdiction over the case, it had no choice but to transfer it to the county court. So um, why, why, I mean, it seems like there's some logic to that argument, right? You can't, party can't confer jurisdiction on the court. A party can't confer jurisdiction on the court. The party can claim jurisdiction of the court. And if the court then agrees, um, I guess we can come up, because you are de novo in this, um, you can rechallenge it. I would point out to the court that what you had here was a situation where the court did originally have jurisdiction, did address this issue. A second court addressed the issue. You had one judge uh, addressing it, Judge Harris twice, and then Judge Maul after that. And I'd point out to the court, if this is a close call, we're talking a lot about judicial resources here and having judges who are already briefed, who've already considered the issue and are prepared to rule and did in fact rule. Is there any, is there any support in Florida law to suggest that judicial efficiencies can override a constitutional mandate of jurisdiction? Not the constitutional mandate. You're right, Judge. So is, do you have any argument besides invited error or judicial efficiencies to support your argument that the court retained jurisdiction over the county court claims? Because I do believe that the because the issue was decided effectively before the defendant, excuse me, before the, the plaintiff addressed the issue. It's the timing of the circumstance I'd ask the court to look at. Is there a case that specifically says this? I have not been able to find one to this point. I'm not sure I'm following the, the argument here that you're, that you're making right now. Yes, what, 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 what was about the timing? There was the dismissal with prejudice, right? Right. Do you agree at that point the circuit court did not have jurisdiction over the case? Once they dismiss it with prejudice, yes. The, the, the claim for injunctive relief. I agree. Okay. So we're, I'm with you there up to that point. What then, how did the circuit court, in your, in your view, how did the circuit court recapture jurisdiction? Well, I, The dismissal with prejudice was, a, was final, correct, as to that claim, as to the claim for injunctive relief? Yes, but I thought that the court dismissed it as to both. And maybe I'm in error on the record here, but I thought the court... I dismissed both counts. Not only the 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 finding was that five five nine did not apply, right? He he did dismiss both counts, one with prejudice and one without. One without. So there was okay. leave to right. refile. So obviously, when you dismiss without prejudice, you, this, the court still has jurisdiction over that claim. Right. So uh, that that's the that's the that's the catch here, right? The injunctive relief claim was dismissed with prejudice. The statutory claim was dismissed with an opportunity to amend, right? And if you look at that order, the amendment was, if you can bring anything new in here. As a technical matter, I think the court is right. But in terms of the practical aspects of what the court was trying to do, yes, we'll give you one more shot at it. But my ruling is essentially my ruling, unless you can bring in and show me something different, which they did not, according to at least the second order on the amended. Well, the, 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 the circuit court only gave them another shot at the statutory claim, right? Correct. That is correct. So on the equitable, that was out. Statutory. So as to the injunctive claim, that order was final. Dismissed with prejudice. Final. Final judgment. And, Circuit and court no longer it. has jurisdiction, right? As to that. Right. So when they brought the claim again for damages, how did the circuit court have jurisdiction to hear the $1,000 damages claim? Or to rule on that because one? The because the court had already begun entertaining argument on that. And the court had already determined that it wanted to retain jurisdiction and deal with this. Uh, Do you have, is there a case anywhere, in Florida or out, where a court can um, maintain jurisdiction simply because it has already entertained argument? I am not aware of a case that has not come to mind in my research that says that particular I mean wouldn't that destroy aspect. wouldn't that destroy the basic principles of finality that we've established over decades well I think in this case the plaintiffs had more than enough due process here the three uh, opportunities to hear that and the question is what is it going to do in terms of the overall 
effect on the arguments here and the position of the parties if we send it down, send it from a busy circuit court down to a busy county court, and I think this would actually fall into small claims. Well, those are very good efficiency arguments, but that's not subject matter jurisdiction. You agree that the circuit court cannot hear claims of $1,000 unless they are tied to something else that gives them jurisdiction. I agree with that, Judge. Okay. So essentially, I mean, I guess the, the, the problem you have here is it's, your, you know, you're almost trying to tag along with the dismissed injunctive injunction claim, claim, wh which was dismissed with prejudice. Yes, because right. the issue was already introduced and inherent in the order. All right, what about the estoppel letter? Uh, the estoppel letter, yeah. if you look at the cases we cite, and I would point the court out to the Parker versus Midland case, and Bailey uh, versus Security National case. Um, of the 92 cases that we attempted to look at of the, in the appellant's brief, um, Aiken, I don't see, stood for the point that an estoppel letter is a debt notice. And again, what we're looking at here, Judge, is the determination of whether that was intended to confer a debt and collect it. And the purpose of the statute is to avoid undue harassment in the collection well, of appellant debt. says prohibit the collection of debts appellant says you attach the invoice you know the invoice had language do, you know due upon receipt i think is is what it was or something of that effect right i mean does attaching the invoice to it at least have at least meet the sort of the factor of is there a demand for payment then um okay. I don't think there's a question that there was a, at one point, a demand for payment, but I don't think that that gets you over the hurdle in this case of whether or not that's a... Well, no, at one point, clearly, there was a demand for payment. I'm saying, does, does, that, does attaching that invoice to the estoppel letter essentially mean that the estoppel letter is demanding payment? It was never communicated, as I understand it, directly to the plaintiff. It was communicated to a title company if memory serves. And whose title and, and company was that? I thought that was, was advice that? on, on potential, potential debts uh, that may travel with the property. I mean, is, that's the purpose of an estoppel letter in such circumstances is to advise a potential purchaser and more to the point, the attorneys and title company, whether there's any additional debts that are hanging around. Pellens ar argues that the title company was essentially an agent for the seller. Do you agree with that? The title company... I, he I, compared it to like sending in the letter to, to the, a lawyer for, for a party. Not in the sense that I think 559 is looking at it. 559, okay, we understand with attorneys. But a title company has duties to about everybody involved, but the duties are very limited as I understand the law. And that is to collect the information and determine whether the title is clear to the extent that there are fiduciary duties arising out of that. And I'm not saying that there are. But if there are any du duties of that type, then they would be extremely limited in nature and would not be the broad type of, of, of agency relationships where you're basically an alter ego that we're looking for under 559. I mean, we're looking for under 559 is a situation where uh, it's somebody very close to and in direct contact all the time with the party. And we're, and we're really almost talking about, aren't we, a kind of an em embarrassment factor, embarrassment or defamation of your credit, and embarrassment to people close to you. That's what the statute, as I read, uh, the case law and what limited legislative history we have was designed to, to prevent, right, that, that type of harm to the consumer. I don't think that that translates to a very limited duty that that, um, that, that title agency might have. So what I'm saying, Judge, is that you know, I, I think there are cases out there that, that provide for more than a sort of contractual relationship for a title company, but I don't think they go anywhere near the level that we need, we need to satisfy um, and find a ruling that that's going to create all these new statutory duties and obligations, and, and mostly remedies. So in sum, you, you, you don't think a title agent is, is an, or a title insurer, a title agent is the same, is, a, is an agent in the same sense that perhaps a lawyer would be? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, not. And I think our law is fairly clear on that. And I would ask the court, I mean, the only thing, when, when I was looking at this, at this appeal, um, the, the thing that caught my eye was, was the Aiken, the Katzman uh, case. And I was trying to figure out um, this bootstrapping of the different terms between debt, fine, and assessment. And that was the only, and I, honestly, I didn't, on the jurisdictional thing, I, I did not believe, and I don't want to get back into that. <laughs> I think you've done a pretty good job, Judge, of, of, of uh, finding out everything I have to know about that. 
Um, but I think if we're looking at what their causes of action are, they're under subsection seven and subsection nine. And subsection seven, I think, is with the continuing frequency, that language to say that it's harassment. And, and part nine was whether they knew the debt was inappropriate. I would point out to the court that the, the purpose of this type of letter and this type of negotiation is to figure out what is appropriate and what is not. And never was there a true assessment because that's the only, to me, the only fingernail they have here is to uh, point out in that case that, and excuse me, that's not the uh, right site to it, but, um, but to point out in that case that somehow there may be language that equates uh, fine with assessment with debt. And I don't think that that makes any sense in this context. The, the term assessment, when you see what we put in that uh, invoice, and then when you look at what was in our homeowner association, it, it was a poor choice of words, but clearly in the context, it was meant to say calculated or determined, not assessment, because there's whole different sections of ours. There's section 30 and section 32 of that homeowners association that says, here's what's going to be a, an assessment. And so I would argue to the court that there is no law out there that there's no case law out there supporting the extension of these type of 559 rights to this type of situation. And I would, I, I would caution that this opens up a great deal of problems down the road about how far we expand this. Is the simple statement of a, a probable debt, a possible debt or a belief of debt, does that carry it all the way through to what the rest of 559 is talking about? And I submit to the court that it does not that we're pretty far afield already in terms of where we're going to find it being a communication sufficient to bring in 559s. Um, and, and, you know, uh, can we talk? It's really about the attorney fees, isn't it? I mean, it's about whether there's going to be a theory here that's going to support, support attorney fees um, along with a $1,000 uh, a penalty uh, or, or damage, liquidated damage out of this. And if we're trying to figure out how best to, to help consumers in this state, I would caution against crying wolf for a statement in, the, in terms of a real estate closing, which I think isn't, doesn't really rise to the term transaction within the statute itself. The transaction was, uh, was the original purchase of the land long ago. What we were trying to do here was to get them to actually build on the property when we said you can't buy this as real estate speculation. That was the nature of the underlying facts was they bought property, there was a specific period of time that you could keep it, and I forget how many, it was like 270 months or something, that you could hold this property, but you had to build on it because they didn't want a lot. So when this came around about the sale of it or another mortgage, it wasn't the underlying transaction we were talking about here, that's what the fine arose out of, and that had nothing to do with an assessment of any type, nature, or style. It had, the, the, what we were trying to do is, um, I think the best term would say, would be um, prohibit certain activities and induce other activities, behavior, which was build on it or sell it, one of the two. So we didn't have a situation here where you would normally have, and when we see most of these cases where somebody's credit's destroyed because you're, you're sending it out uh, to a ton of different people that you know are going to harm them, or you're calling up the house at, at 2 a.m. and telling somebody's grandmother that their, their son's a deadbeat or something. That's not the circumstances here at all. Um, so from our point of view, assuming the court can get over this, this issue, and, and I don't mean it that way, I mean, but I, I do believe there was jurisdiction here, that the courts have general jurisdiction and broad jurisdiction. Um, uh, once we get past that, though, I don't think that there's any basis really for expanding the law to include this type of real estate transactional letter that didn't even go to the consumer as a, uh, as a basis for a, a finding under 559. Thank you, Council. Council, you do have a minute 50 left, I think, if you, yeah. if you could go back to the podium yes. if you're going to use Thank it. Thank you. Just yeah. for the mic. Thank you. My bad. 
Um, it had been pointed out that the plaintiff in the Second Amendment complaint did replete injunctive relief. I think we need to take a look at that part of the record. If that is true, then I think the court did maintain jurisdiction through the whole thing. It, can you replete something that's been dismissed? Yeah, I mean, with that, that was that was sort of half of the argument we had with <clears throat> with the appellant is you know what does that mean? Just because it's replead, does it mean that we're you know the circuit court then has jurisdiction again, or does it simply mean the circuit court has to dismiss that? for lack of jurisdiction? That'd be up to the circuit judge, but the initial idea behind, the, the uh, initial addressing of it would have to be the circuit court, would it not? So the court would have jurisdiction to begin with there. Then I guess we get into- Well, the court certainly has jurisdiction to determine its jurisdiction, right? I mean, it cer certainly has the ability to dismiss, if it, if it determines it has no jurisdiction, it can certainly dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. It, judges also have the uh, ability and authority to uh, treat a motion in a different way. He, the, the court could treat that motion any one of a, a number of different ways. So to the treat court, the complaint? No. The re, well, the repleting of the complaint, and if there was a motion to dismiss. The You're court suggesting they could rephrase it. So and a, say, a party could override the limited jurisdiction of the circuit court by filing an inappropriate claim over and over and over and over again in order to maintain jurisdiction in the circuit now court. Now, at some point, you would be subject to sanctions, Judge. It would be 57105 if the court believed that. Unless there was the court something. decided that it wanted to retain jurisdiction and decide not to sanction them. I guess that's a possibility in the practical aspects of busy circuit judges. I doubt that that would carry on very long. The judges I practiced before would make short work of it if there was a continuous repleting of the of something. I guess this just goes back to the same point I was trying to raise that the defense, the the appellant kept trying to raise something to keep it in the circuit court. Right. Well, counsel, your time is up. Thank I you. You have a minute and 53 left. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think I've said all that I needed to say on the jurisdictional issue. Uh, I think that the, this case should probably just um, be reversed on that issue. I don't think the court really addresses the other issues if the jurisdiction wasn't proper. So um, and, and if there's a reversal just on the jurisdictional issue, I think we, we, there should be instructions for it to go back down to county court. Um, on the, the the court does have the option to dismiss or transfer, though, correct? It has the option to dismiss or transfer. Yes, at the at, uh, well, I don't know if it's got the option to dismiss it after it's um, just stripped it of the equitable relief and its hook, its jurisdictional hook to exercise ju um, jurisdiction over the action. The appropriate remedy would would be to either dismiss the claim with prejudice well, the, um, or, or to transfer, according to one point. Of yeah, well, RAPA, this, in RAPA, which it was cited in my brief, this court stated that uh, the case should be transferred to county court, which has equitable jurisdiction over matters within its jur jurisdictional amount. So that case says that if you've got a case in the wrong court, uh, it should just be put in the right court. I think that that's the, the appropriate result in this case. So it, just so I'm following what your position is, your, is, is your position that if we reverse on the jurisdictional issue, the injunctive claim is gone, the claim for the injunction is gone, but you still have your statutory claim? Yeah, I think it's gone, but I, you know, I, it's something that potentially I can raise at the finality of the case once the county court. And that's, of course, not an issue before us, but you're, you're essentially saying that you think it's a partial final judgment. I think it's a partial final later. judgment, yep, and, and, but, you know, if this case goes down to county court, I can raise whether that dismissal is proper at the circuit court appellate level. But, but nevertheless, if you prevail on the jurisdictional issue, there's only one claim remaining then at that point, in this, and that's the statutory claim. Yeah, and it should go. For now, anyway. And it should go from here to circuit, and the circuit sets it down to county. All right, thank you, counsel. Thank you.